<laughs> Every 25 minutes, one of our military members, the very men and women who keep this nation free, is sexually assaulted. This is a statistic taken from the RAND Corporation. And it reveals that there's a clear need within the military justice system to reform the way that we deal with sexual assault. Now, in recent years, uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand of New York has introduced a bill called the Military Justice Improvement Act, which seeks to move prosecutorial discretion outside of the chain of command and to give it to an independent JAG investigator who would come to a conclusion about that case. Now, uh, there are multiple people on both sides of this issue, so we're gonna be hearing from multiple different experts today. First, we're gonna be hearing from congressional subcommittees. We're also gonna hear from world-class research organizations. And finally, we're going to hear from multiple different experts who are gonna comment on the issue. Now, when making any decision related to an important policy topic, it's important to look at both sides of the story. And so I'm gonna be analyzing the underlying assumptions and the evidence that both sides present. So let's start off by jumping in with the problem. Now those that support the MJIA say that the main problem is rampant sexual assault. Now according again to the 2014 Rand Corporation survey, an estimated 20,300 people a year are sexually assaulted in the United States military. The same study documented that in a single year, 22% of women in the US military were sexually harassed. This is a severe issue that clearly needs to be addressed. And that's exactly why the Military Justice Improvement Act was first brought before Congress, because they want to make a way to ensure that justice is going to be given, that perpetrators or potential perpetrators are going to be less likely to commit their crime. But those that are against the MJIA actually are looking at the same statistics and coming to different conclusions. One individual is Stephen Holmes, JD and PhD, who made a statement that sexual assault actually decreased by 27% between the years 2012 and 2014. And so the point of those that are against the bill are making is just the idea that if, that if sexual assault is decreasing by 27%, then there's no reason to pass such a drastic bill um, that would end up making large changes in the military justice system if the problem is already being solved. But in order to truly understand this issue, you have to look at the causes or the reasons behind why sexual assault might be occurring. Those that support the MJA uh, claim that there are large amounts of sexual assault because of a biased prosecution system. Now, according to Senator Kirsten Killebrand, in the current system, uh, when a sexual assault or any criminal action within the US military occurs, an independent JAG investigator comes and investigates what's happened. He investigates the scene of the crime, and then at the, at the conclusion of his investigation, he gives a recommendation to the, to the commander of the unit, somebody in the chain of command, as to whether or not the case should actually be prosecuted. And uh, once that happens, the full decision-making power lies in the hands of the person that's presiding over the unit. Now here's the problem. According to Protect Our Defenders, 60% of victims that are sexually harassed in the US military are harassed by someone in their chain of command. So essentially what's happening is that we're asking the perpetrators of the crimes to oftentimes prosecute their own cases. And that doesn't lead to justice. It's a biased system, at least in the sense of those that are pro-MJAA. But also, again, those that are against the bill are looking at the exact same system and coming to different conclusions. What they're coming to is that the military is actually already fixing the problem. Now, according to a report from the Role on the Commander Subcommittee in the United States Congress, uh, authority has actually been moved for prosecutorial discretion further up the chain of command. So the commander of the unit is oftentimes not the one who's actually with the decision-making power in a sexual assault case. And someone who is further up the chain of command or a more, certainly far more removed from the situation is the one that actually has the decision-making power, which means that there's going to be less bias in the system and more objectivity, which will supposedly lead to more justice. Yet those that uh, want the MJA to be passed claim that these reforms aren't actually fully fixing the problem. And so that leads to why they want the MJA to actually be passed. But we have to ask ourselves the question, is the bill even gonna work in the first place? And that relates to the point of cure. Now, those that want the bill to be passed point to precedent in order to try and prove that the bill will be successful. 
Now, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand and James Joynick and James W. Warwick of War on the Rocks made a statement that actually previous Western nations, for example, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia, have all passed legislation similar to the MJIA. And when the bills were actually enacted in those nations, these experts are observing that it seemed like there was more justice that was consistently occurring in those nations at that point in time. Yet those that are against the bill actually are looking at the exact same evidence and they're coming to different, different conclusions. They're using the idea that the precedent of those exact same nations actually proves the failure that the Military Justice Improvement Act would produce. Now, Charles Stimson of the Heritage Foundation wrote that some proponents of removal of, of command authority have identified the success stories of similar policies in Canada, New Zealand, and Australia and the United States and urged the United States to follow suit. But, the, but these countries' removal of prosecutions from the chain of command can hardly be touted as success for victims. He goes on to make the statement that when power was given to JAG-like attorneys in these other nations, sexual assaults actually remained the same or increased because there was more backup in the systems when people were continually recommending that these cases were prosecuted in trial. So giving power to JAG investigators actually ended up hurting those that, those that were victims of the sexual assault instead of helping them. But those that criticize the MJA don't just stop here. They've also highlighted costs or disadvantages to passing the bill. Now again, their main disadvantage is that military effectiveness would be compromised if this bill was passed. Now a recent article from The Hill described this in which they stated that military effectiveness would be compromised and the unit would operate less effectively if prosecutorial discretion was removed from the chain of command. And that to take that away would compromise the cohesion of, a, of the unit and the respect for the chain of command in the first place. However, those that support the bill actually highlight an underlying assumption behind this alleged disadvantage that those that are against the MJA point to. And their point is that effectiveness is actually primarily abridged by assault in the first place. Colonel Don Christensen, the president of Protect Our Defenders, made a state of, of Protect Our Defenders made a statement where he said it is time to stop sacrificing justice for survivors at the altar of good order and discipline. And the reality is that good order and discipline is undermined when criminals are allowed to act with impunity and not held accountable for their crimes. So the point that he's making here is that if sexual assaults are occurring, the unit is going to be far less effective than if, than if prosecutorial discretion was removed from the chain of command. So how do legislatures make decisions? What is, what is the way that they can decide whether who to vote for and who to reject? Well, that goes down to the underlying assumptions. And so let's review those before the conclusion of this speech. Now, the main uh, underlying assumption of those that support the Military Justice Improvement Act is that correlation somehow equals causation. Their idea is that simply because there's high level of sexual assault in the military, and there seems to be an allegedly biased system of prosecution, that that must mean that high sexual assault is coming from that supposedly biased prosecution system. Yet they're going to have to prove more than this if they're gonna show that the bill is worthy of being passed. They can't just say that correlation must equal causation. Also, those that are against the MJA don't consider that units are primarily undermined by sexual assault. So their main disadvantage also seems to have a major assumption and a flaw that was again highlighted by Colonel Don Christensen. So again, we see that it's important to look at both sides of the story when weighing who to vote for and who to reject. And that's why Walter Cronkite said, in seeking the truth, you have to get both sides of the story. Thank you.